clinical approaches to connective tissue related interstitial lung disease. It's a fairly big topic for 30 minutes, but I'll try to do my best. Um, so, connective tissue disease related pulmonary diseases, uh, ILD is very common in connective tissue disorders. Um, up to 90% of patients um, have connective tissue disease. The highest prevalence is in patients with systemic sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and dermatomyositis and polymyositis. Um, so can I just, uh, one thing, this is my old talk. This, there's an updated version of this talk. Can we pull that up instead? most of them could be clinically silent. Uh, there's significant morbidity and mortality that are associated with interstitial lung disease in the setting of collagen vascular diseases. The highest prevalence occurs in patients with systemic sclerosis, polymyositis and dermatomyositis, mixed connective tissue disease, and the highest mortality in, uh, includes patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The reason for this is that patients with rheumatoid arthritis oftentimes have a more fibrotic nature to their disease as opposed to the other three uh, who have more of an inflammatory um, phenotype. There are many challenges in diagnosing these conditions. For uh, one reason is that there's a wide range of presentations in these conditions. Some patients may uh, present to your clinic with just a simple cough while others could present to your clinic with acute respiratory failure. <coughs> this presents many clinical challenges. In addition, many um, of the symptoms of these conditions are underreported because patients with uh, collagen vascular diseases have significant functional limitations. Pulmonary function <coughs> testing may be normal in some interstitial lung diseases. That could be attributable to the fact that there's concomitant <coughs> obstructive lung disease that normalizes the pulmonary function testing and minimizes the appearance of the restriction. In addition, there's a lack of clinical trials in this area, which makes treatment very challenging for clinicians. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define connective tissue disease-related ILD as a diffuse parenchymal lung disease that occurs in patients with a definable <coughs> connective tissue disease or signs, symptoms, and lab abnormalities suggestive of connective tissue disease. The etiology of these entities is unknown, but we know that circulating autoantibodies play a significant role. Most patients that come to your attention will have pulmonary symptoms, but it's important to note that a subset of patients do not have uh, clinical um, symptoms. This is some data from National Jewish Hospital in Denver, Colorado, and it shows you that while um, some entities, such as diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, only occur in a subset of patients with connective tissue disease, interstitial lung disease occurs pretty much across the board. Keep in mind that lung disease may be the first manifestation of connective tissue disease and that it can occur in the absence of joint symptoms. In some patients, the joint symptoms can come five to 10 years after the interstitial lung disease. So it's important to keep these things in mind. This oftentimes occurs with younger patients um, and it presents as a subacute illness in a previously healthy patient and these folks oftentimes have rapid deterioration in their symptoms. 
It's crucial to make this diagnosis of interstitial lung disease early in these patients so we can impact their care. Um, we need to evaluate these patients for um, associated infection. And in patients whose oxygenation is adequate, consideration should be given to bronchoalveolar lavage. In addition, serologic testing is very useful. In fact, I recommend serologic testing in just about everyone who presents with interstitial lung disease, even in the absence of joint findings. So let's talk about the first steps. Um, as you know, sometimes the turnaround for labs is very slow, and sometimes we have to make clinical decisions in the absence of laboratory data. So how do we do this? Well, our diagnosis is sometimes limited by the availability of testing, and so history becomes very, very relevant. Uh, it's important to focus on family history, as many autoimmune conditions are lumped in families and there's a family history associated. In addition, pay particular attention to the nature of the presentation. Is the presentation acute or is it subacute? Has the patient had any exposures? I think that overall a multi-system approach is very important when uh, treating these patients as rheumatologists, dermatologists, and pulmonologists can work closely to make these diagnoses. I would not recommend surgical lung biopsy before a connective tissue disease evaluation, and we will discuss this uh, shortly. I think we're all pretty familiar with the history that uh, needs to be taken in these patients uh, with um, uh, autoimmune-related lung disease, but let's quickly review. It's important, obviously, to talk about joint manifestations, although we both know that um, joint manifestations may not exist. It's important to consider joint swelling, changes in nail beds, changes in the skin around uh, the joints, hair loss, rashes, and of particular importance in issues like scleroderma would be difficulty swallowing and increasing acid reflux. Muscular pain and weakness should also be considered. So this is a busy slide, but basically uh, the point that I'd like to make is that uh, while it's nice to have serologic data, a lot of our lab values um, in autoimmune conditions are not helpful. Um, labs including ANA, rheumatoid factor, are very nonspecific, and uh, they can be very low sensitivity. So it's important to have other um, things to help. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, I'm really going to focus on two different types of interstitial lung disease because they are the most common. In autoimmune-related uh, lung disease, the most common patterns are NSIP, non-specific interstitial pneumonitis, followed by UIP, or usual interstitial pneumonitis. Why is it important to make a clinical distinction between you two, between these two? I'm often asked this question, and the reason is prognosis. Um, patients who have UIP, who are in the green area, have a much lower survival than patients who have NSIP. And so it's very important to distinguish between these two entities. <coughs> we heard about this a little bit in the uh, previous talk, but uh, HRCT has a tremendous role in helping us with this diagnosis. It gives us uh, diagnostic and prognostic uh, information, and it can allow us to make a diagnosis of uh, connective tissue-related ILD even before the patient has symptoms. Keep in mind that algorithms only exist uh, for the radiologic uh, evaluation of UIP and scleroderma-related interstitial lung disease. And so having a dedicated chest radiologist is very, very helpful. But in the absence of a dedicated chest radiologist, it is important to familiarize yourself with some of the patterns that are seen on high-resolution CAT scan imaging. I'm going to briefly go over those. This is a classic um, CAT scan for nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis. <coughs> 
here you can see a significant amount of what we call ground glass. It's distributed over multiple uh, lobes of the lung, from upper to lower. And you can see some mild associated um, uh, bron uh, traction bronchiectasis. Alternatively, you do not see a whole lot of fibrosis here. This is more of an inflammatory condition with uh, limited fibrosis. In comparison, this is a slide that shows usual interstitial pneumonitis. This is a fibrotic lung disease and oftentimes goes on to become end-stage uh, fibrotic lung. Uh, we saw this also in the previous uh, lecture, but there's a significant amount here of um, lower lobe honeycombing and subcoral fibrosis with traction bronchiectasis. If you look closely, you can see the difference between these two slides. On the left side, we have NSIP. On the right side, we have UIP. UIP is more predominant at the bases. NSIP occurs in all areas of the lung. NSIP is more inflammatory. UIP is more fibrotic. So what is then the role of surgical lung biopsy? Well, that's a good question. And I think the biggest role is that it provides us um, a way to make a diagnosis and give prognosis to our patients. But this is not the only way that we can uh, diagnose interstitial lung disease. And many patients who present with typical features like I saw, showed you in the previous slide don't really need to have a surgical lung biopsy. I do recommend surgical lung biopsy in patients who have very atypical features or in whom features of both NSIP and UIP exist together, for example. In deciding whether to perform a surgical lung biopsy, one has to take patient preferences into consideration. I find that if you speak to your patients and inform them that they have options, they can help you make the decision as to what they would like to do. You have to give them a risk-benefit analysis and let them know that there are significant risks associated with um, lung biopsy in, in patients. These risks include non-resolving pneumothoraces, particularly in patients that have had significant steroid therapy. These risks include cardiopulmonary complications, and possible exacerbations in ILD after surgery have been reported. So then, what is the timing of treatment? We have many patients that present to our clinic with interstitial lung disease, but it's hard to know um, when to initiate uh, immunomodulatory treatment. I think that there are very minimal guidelines for this, um, but what I would recommend would be to consider treatment in patients who have more than 20% involvement of their lung on high resolution CAT scan imaging. And to consider treatment in uh, patients who have a forced vital capacity of less than 70%, and in those who have a rapidly progressive disease. These are guidelines and every patient should be treated in a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, basis, but these are generalized guidelines from our clinical practice. So then how do we treat these patients? Well, there's no single management strategy that's appropriate for every patient. Um, sometimes mild disease does not need to be treated, um, and patients may have mild disease that does not progress and can just be monitored with pulmonary function testing. What I can say that general guidelines include the use of supplemental oxygen with resting hypoxia, treatment of acid reflux as it can exacerbate the interstitial lung disease, frequent monitoring of the patient's physiology with lung function testing, and close clinical follow-up. There is not a whole lot of evidence-based medicine in this field, but I would like to review with you the few studies that are evidence-based, and I think that you can um, guide some of your management based on the findings of these studies. Uh, the first was the Scleroderma Lung Study that was, uh, that was published in the New England Journal in 2006. 
This is a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study of 158 patients. There are two arms in this study. The first arm, um, the patients received cyclophosphamide at a dose of two milligrams per kilogram per day over a period of one year. And the second arm received a placebo. Pulmonary function testing was assessed every three months and results showed that there was statistically significant improvement in forced vital capacity and dyspnea scores in patients who received cyclophosphamide. Keep in mind that the improvements were very, very modest, and there's no improvement noted in DLCO, only in the forced vital capacity. The second study um, that I'd like to bring to your attention is the scleroderma lung study two that was published in 2015. Uh, it is also a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled study. Um, not a large uh, number of patients, 142 in this study. But this study had two arms. There was a cyclophosphamide arm and a mycophenolate arm. Um, forced vital capacity and dyspnea scores improved in both groups, both in the cyclophosphamide group and the mycophenolate group. But there was a trend towards improved functioning uh, was greater in the uh, cyclophosphamide group. Of note is the fact that the patients who received mycophenolate, however, had lower incidence of complications including leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. So we now have two studies that show the benefit of cyclophosphamide in the setting of scleroderma and uh, one indication that mycophenolate may be useful in this population. Uh, the next uh, series of data that we have is a randomized controlled study that's unblinded. Um, the patients, uh, there were 60 patients in this study, small study. Uh, it looked at oral cyclophosphamide versus oral azathioprine, Imuran. In this study, um, the cyclophosphamide group showed stability in forced vital capacity and diffusion capacity, but the azathioprine group did not, and in fact, their lung function deteriorated over time. The, um, the, the, uh, Evaluators concluded that cyclophosphamide was a promising medication for the treatment of scleroderma related lung disease. In 2012, we have an observational study that was published by a group in Greece that looked at rituximab um, for two year follow up after treatment. Results in this group showed statistically significant yet modest improvements in forced vital capacity and DLCO. And the USTAR study that was published in 2015 reiterated this finding that rituxan was beneficial in preventing decline in forced vital capacity. So let's review the different types of interstitial lung disease related to the collagen vascular diseases. Um, Scleroderma interstitial lung disease, we just finished reviewing those studies. We know that there were two randomized controlled trials in this setting that show benefit for cyclophosphamide with the second line agent being mycophenolate. There is some retrospective data from our group in Denver, Colorado that shows that high dose prednisone in this group is not beneficial and we would caution against the use of high dose prednisone in this group because there is a tendency towards scleroderma related acute renal failure. Uh, the duration of treatment should be individually tailored in these patients, and early transplantation referral uh, should be considered inappropriate candidates. Rheumatoid arthritis related interstitial lung disease. Um, this is the one case in which usual interstitial pneumonia is more common than non specific interstitial pneumonia. As you know, Usual interstitial pneumonia has a much worse prognosis, and so these patients are much more at risk for rapid deterioration. Patients who are more likely to have lung disease, interstitial lung disease in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis include smokers, males, patients with high antibody titers, and patients with a family history of rheumatoid arthritis. 
For these patients, because of the potential for rapid deterioration and for a worse prognosis, I recommend earlier imaging to see if they have asymptomatic interstitial lung disease. In this group, there's no randomized controlled trials, but retrospective data from National Jewish Hospital shows us that mycophenolate and rituxan can be beneficial in this group. In patients with uh, polymyositis and dermatomyositis associated lung disease, risk factors for interstitial lung disease include age greater than 45, joint involvement, and positivity of uh, topisoarase anti-GO1. Um, there's really no good data in this arena, but observational studies uh, and expert opinions suggest the use of steroids as first line, second line being mycophenolate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, and rituxan. And finally, mixed connective tissue disease associated ILD. Uh, there's a very high association with interstitial lung disease, but absolutely no randomized controlled data. Steroids are the mainstay of therapy, and steroid sparing agents are recommended. So patients with interstitial lung disease related to uh, collagen vascular disease present in both acute and chronic uh, ways. So uh, in patients that present acutely, it's important to rule out uh, other things that can precipitate hypoxia, such as pulmonary embolism, arrhythmias, congestive heart failure, pneumothoraces. Um, these folks have a very, very high mortality. Treatment should be um, centered around um, quick diagnosis. Patients should be covered broadly with antibiotics to include atypical organisms. Patients who meet criteria should be covered for pneumocystis gerbecki based on risk factors and uh, treatment uh, with immunosuppression. Uh, offending agents should be removed. Acid reflux should be treated. And we recommend the use of pulse steroids at a dose of one gram IV daily for three days with long-term steroid taper over many months. Consideration should also be given to IVIG therapy and autoimmune myositis. And consideration should be given to cyclophosphamide uh, with rapid deterioration of lung disease. General treatment guidelines, therefore, let's review. There are significant limitations in our understanding of these conditions and very few randomized controlled trials to guide our therapy. Treatment is therefore based on case series, physician preference, and institutional patterns. But general guidelines include um, the initiation of steroid, uh, steroids over, uh, high dose steroids and then tapering over several months. The one caveat to this is with scleroderma, uh, which uh, you would not start high dose steroids in because of the potential for precipitating renal failure, renal crisis. Um, Generally speaking, we at our institution start with mycophenol, mycophenolate um, because of the low incidence of toxicity with this medication. Patients who do have uh, GI toxicity from mycophenolate may benefit from a different formulation called myfortic. For second line agents, we typically use azathioprine. And we shy away from methotrexate because of the potential for methotrexate to cause its own form of interstitial lung disease. Keep in mind that there are emerging treatments uh, in this field, but none that are uh, ready to go yet. Uh, they, we are looking currently at profenadone and nintetinib. Uh, there is also um, a combination of a monoclonal antibody and mycophenolate that is being investigated currently, but nothing is uh, certain yet as to whether or not these are effective. So the recommendations that I have for you based on the, these data include having a very low threshold for evaluating interstitial lung disease in connective tissue disease, but especially in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and polymyositis, dermatomyositis. I would recommend early enrollment of patients with pulmonary rehab 
to Im uh, improve their symptoms. I would recommend ensuring that patients are fully vaccinated against um, pneumococcal organisms and also against viruses, including influenza. I would recommend ensuring normoxia, both daytime and nighttime. I would recommend following patients with subclinical disease very closely with at least every six month pulmonary function testing to ensure that they do not deteriorate. And I would consider immunomodulatory uh, therapy uh, in patients with severe or progressive disease. Consider enrollment in clinical trials and refer to a transplant center for uh, early aggressive disease. So in conclusion, interstitial lung disease is a significant manifestation of collagen vascular diseases with high associated morbidity and mortality. It's very important to distinguish usual interstitial pneumonitis from nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis as there is a very different prognostic uh, features in those two diseases. High resolution CT scan imaging is generally sufficient to diagnose interstitial lung disease, but in patients who present with atypical features, open lung biopsy can be suggested. There are very few randomized controlled trials in this field, and most recommendations are based on open label trials and observational studies. And the exception to this is uh, in patients with scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. Thanks for your time today.